Welcome everyone um, to our FTD um, support group um, webinar. Um, it's nice to see um, everybody again. Um, it's been a bit of time since we've been doing um, these virtual meetings. Um, and um, just to let everyone know um, that um, we will be continuing on with a hybrid um, of um, virtual and in-person meetings um, when we um, uh, start our set of meetings for 2022. Our hope is that we'll be able to do an in-person um, meeting um, in March of next year. So for those of you that have been um, part of this group for a number of years, you'll know that once a year we do a, a kind of annual um, seminar um, which is really a, almost a whole day meeting and, and aimed partly at, at, at new members, but also people who've been um, part of the group for some time. So that annual seminar, which is a, will be hopefully most of the day, um, will be in uh, March and, and fingers crossed in person. But we've had lots of good feedback about um, doing these virtual meetings. It's allowed a lot of people who couldn't otherwise make the in-person meetings to come. So we're going to carry on. Um, doing a hybrid and do some of um, some of these virtual meetings um, as well. So, um, just a few bits um, of housekeeping. You'll see um, both a Q and A and a chat box. So, um, the Q and A box is for the questions. So, if you have any questions at any time, please put them in the Q and A box. We'll take some as we go, but we've got a, um, a Q and A session at the end, um, and we'll go through them. Um, go through all of them then. Um, uh, the chat box is not for questions, but you want to say hello or put anything in that, then please feel free to do that. Um, as you heard, um, the, um, uh, the meeting is being recorded, so don't worry if there's anything you want um, to hear, you'll be able to play it back later on. Um, if there are any um, resources that people share, um, you can put those in, in the chat, but if there's anything that um, comes from the speakers, um, we will happily share all of those um, resources um, afterwards. So today um, we're focused um, on really the overlap. And of course, the reason why um, this condition is, is complex is that as well as often the core symptoms, there are often overlapping symptoms. That's why they're all really part of the same spectrum. So although we see people that present mainly with behavioral problems or present mainly with language problems, and then there's this group of conditions that present mainly with movement problems, they're all part of a, a spectrum. So today we're going to focus on people whose main symptom is a change in behavior. But we're going to talk about the other symptoms that people can develop when they have first developed behavioral problems. So we're going to hear from um, our very specialist speech therapist, Anna um, Volkmer, who many of you will have heard from and met before, who'll talk about language. I'm very pleased to have um, Tim Rittman um, from the Cambridge FTD group here, who's going to talk about motor symptoms. Tim and I met many years ago um, as um, junior doctors, and we've known each other for many years. It's really a pleasure to have Tim um, come and talk today, um, and he'll um, also be um, on the panel um, at the end. And then we're going to hear um, from um, really a, a, a patient perspective from a carer, Leo, who will um, talk with Nikki about her own perspective of um, uh, really non-behavioral symptoms and someone who presented with um, a change in behavior first. I'm gonna wrap up a little bit along the way about some other symptoms, but very happy to hear from people um, about their own um, uh, lived experience of, of symptoms. Um, and we can talk a little bit at the end, particularly in the Q&A about um, how we might deal with some of those um, other non-behavioral um, symptoms as well. So um, welcome to all. Um, uh, just to say um, that, um, as you know, we obviously run this group, the FTD support group. And um, for those with a language presentation, they're also welcome to go along as well to the PPA support group, the primary progressive aphasia support group. And those that have a, a genetic or familial form, we also have the FFTD or familial FTD support group that's really aimed at people from families and living at risk. But um, Nikki and her team have um, slowly um, started to develop some more, more meetings and peer meetings, and we're doing lots of 
and research into thinking about what people want from our support groups. Um, and so there's lots more happening. So um, just before we um, start Anna's talk, I'm going to ask Nikki just to give us an overview of a couple of projects and a couple of groups that are um, now underway. Nikki. Thanks, John. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here. So I'm just going to slightly update you on a few things that we've started. So we had an overwhelming response in the last year to um, buddying. So what we've now done is we've changed that into some buddy peer support groups. So these are groups that are meeting monthly and the FTD one meets on the first Wednesday of each month at two o'clock for an hour and a half. And it's lightly facilitated by me and Trish, one of the other members of the direct support team. And it's a safe space for carers to come, to have a chat with other carers, and to hopefully meet like-minded individuals that they want to actually connect with. So we're quite happy for them to share their details and um, make their own connections that way. So we started this this month, and we hope to do this every month going forward, like I said, at the first Wednesday of each month. So please get in contact with us. Please get in contact us with us via email rather than in the chat today, because it's much better if we can actually sort that out of the meeting today. I um, also want to tell you about a couple of uh, projects that are going on which um, you as members would like to get involved in maybe you know we're always looking for member participation and one of them is an online focus group which is being run by a speech and language um, student and this is supervised by Dr Chris Hardy and Dr Anna Volkmar the speech and language therapist and she's really looking at how speech and language therapy affects people with BVFTD so this will be starting next month so again if you're interested in this it was in the newsletter with full details but you can also contact us at the direct support team and we can filter this through and the last thing that I want to talk about is we've spoke about this before previous meetings but uh, our lovely PhD student and palliative nurse Ali Rose Sisk is looking for any caregivers of people in sort of the mid to later stages of FTD uh, to be involved in her research which is looking at the physical social and spiritual needs of people with FTD so this is really in hope to improve care in the future so if you again if you'd like to get involved please send us a quick email and we will pass you on to Ali Rose thank you great thanks Nikki so um without further ado and not getting too far behind already on time um we'll start um hearing from um Anna Volkmer um about um language symptoms um in people that have behavioral variants FTD Hello everybody, my name is Anna Volkmer. I'm a senior speech and language therapist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And I'm also a lecturer at UCL and I lecture in the role of the speech and language therapist uh, working with people with dementia. Now I've been asked to talk to you today about language difficulties in behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. And I thought I'd start by talking about communication more broadly. When we talk about communication, we use this term as an umbrella term to capture lots of different aspects of communication. One aspect of communication is understanding what people say, so understanding language. The other, another aspect is speaking or uh, choosing words and sentences, so using expressing language. But then we also read and write, and this is another form of communication. And on top of all of that, communication can't, cannot occur without a good understanding of social skills, of what's appropriate to say, how close is appropriate to stand to somebody, how to make eye contact or not to make eye contact. And then those central thinking skills, so planning when to talk, what to say, when to take a turn, and judging how much to say. But today I'm really gonna focus only on understanding and speaking in terms of language and how that works in behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. What do I mean by understanding? Well, understanding is perhaps a little bit more complicated than we all think it is. When we hear a word, 
the first thing that we have to do is actually hear it. And once we've heard those sounds, we need to be able to decide whether these sounds are a word, whether they're a car going past or the wind in the trees. We need to be able to differentiate that word from all the background noise that we're hearing. Once we've understood that we've heard a word, we then have to identify whether we know the word and do we have that word in our mental dictionary. If we've decided we do have that word in, in our mental dictionary, we are then able to decide what that word means using the information in our mental dictionary. Now, when we decide to say a word, so when we decide we want to speak, we also have to go through a similar process. We have to decide what concept we want to say, what idea we want to convey. So for example, if I wanted to talk about an apple, the first thing I'd have to do is think up the idea of an apple. Then I'd have to check if I've got the word for that apple in my mental dictionary, in my lexicon of words. And once I'd found that file in my mental dictionary or filing cabinet, I'd have to open that file and check out what that recipe is for that word. What are the component parts of that word? And then I need to actually say the word, instruct the muscles of my lip and tongue and mouth to articulate the sounds so I can say the word apple. So there we go. This process of understanding language and expressing words is much more complicated than we may have thought in the first instance. And therefore it can go wrong at many different levels. And we know that for people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, it can go wrong at a number of levels. For example, at the level of understanding, people often have difficulties understanding single words. So here we have an example. So if somebody said to a person with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, can we go swimming? They might understand the principle that they're being asked to go somewhere, but what they might not understand is the key word swimming. Similarly, we know that people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia may have certain difficulties saying those words. So this can be particularly difficult in conversation if the person with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is trying to convey something and their partner isn't 100% sure what they're trying to convey. I've talked about single words, that there are lots of different types of single words. And in our mental lexicon, that filing cabinet or dictionary of words in our brain, we keep them sorted in terms of the types of words they are. We keep them sorted in terms of the categories um, of meaning. And we keep them sorted in terms of the sounds that link together. But what we know is that one of the ways we keep them sorted is in terms of the types of words. So we know that we may keep verbs or action words together. So things like swimming, running, riding. We may also have adjectives or describing words. So things like hot or tall. We may also have prepositions in our categories of words. And prepositions are words that convey where something is. So for example, on top of or inside of. We may also have certain words grouped together which are all nouns, apple, dog, boy, okay? Now we know that for people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, there is some evidence that they have particular difficulties at using verbs, action words, um, in comparison to other types of words. Now, as I'm going through these descriptions, you might find that these difficulties don't resonate with you. And it's really important to, to explain here that what I'm describing is doesn't apply to everybody with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And that we these are just some of the things that have been noticed in the research literature. And I'm going to go through a couple more. Some people will actually experience more difficulties in articulating the sounds in a word. So for example, if the person wanted to say the word apple, they may find that they are trying to generate that word 
So they, they get the letters in the, in the word mixed up and instead of saying apple, they might say lapple or papple without realizing sometimes people may be able to self-correct and, and get the right recipe for the word and say apple, but at other times they may not. And we call this phonological errors because each of the parts of a word, the phonemes like p, a, l, we describe those speech sounds as phonemes. So those vowels and consonant sounds, those phonemes get mixed up in the word, in the recipe. That said, some people with um, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia may actually not say a lot. And this can be really tricky for partners if we don't actually know what the person is thinking. People with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia may be able to articulate well, but it, we might find that the, they get stuck on things and we call this perseveration. So they may get stuck on a word or a phrase. So cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea. That can be quite tricky because it's not always clear if someone gets stuck on a word or a phrase, if it's what they actually mean. So if we try and clarify, that can help. But equally, some people may also find they develop something called echolalia, which is almost like copying the last thing that the other person has said to them. And it's a bit like getting stuck. You might find that you're talking to your loved one and they're saying cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea. And when you go to clarify it, do you want a tea or a coffee? They may repeat back what you've said. Do you want a tea or a coffee? which is really confusing again. And I just wanted to touch, I've spoken so far mainly about the single words, but actually sometimes we find that people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia also have problems organizing their sentences and their, their stories. So we call this grammar and narrative. So we might find that their sentences don't quite make sense. So here's, a, here's an example, doctor, had a cup of tea, Sheila. It's not quite clear in this example who did what and when. We know that those are things that have been observed in the research literature, and I've seen those in my clinical experience, and they can be really difficult because they result in a breakdown in the conversation. One of the things we also know with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is that whilst the person with the diagnosis may be making their errors, they may not always realize, in fact, they often don't have the insight to recognize that they're making conversation more difficult than it usually is. But this can be really difficult for the other person in the relationship who is trying to support their loved one, can be really frustrating. And it's really hard to know what to do in this situation to improve the conversation, to improve the interaction. In my role as a speech and language therapist, I often meet people with language difficulties related to rare dementias, such as behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. Now, the problem with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia for me is that there isn't any research evidence around my role with this group. So what I do is I can borrow from what I know about other rare dementias and um, the evidence of what works there. And we tend to group this into three main areas. So I know that one of the things I can do for lots of people is do exercises to maintain language. So that might mean for some people practicing certain words to maintain keep them there and keep the instructions in the right order. Now, the key to this type of exercise is that you have to practice regularly in small doses. So I, when I do this kind of intervention, I encourage people to do small amounts of practice, say 15 minutes every day. And the other key to this, this type of intervention is that you practice words that are meaningful to you in your everyday life. This type of intervention has to be carefully designed to suit the needs of the, the person um, and to address the level of difficulty that the person has. So that's exercises. The second area that speech and language therapy might work on is strategies to compensate or get around a communication difficulty. 
Um, so this can include things like um, supporting a person to use alternative ways of communicating than using the word per se. So it might mean encouraging somebody to describe a word, encouraging people to use gesture, drawing, um, encouraging alternative means of conveying information. And then finally, we often work with people around the person. And, and actually, if I'm absolutely honest, this is probably the area I do most work when I'm working with people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia to date. And I find that I end up working with, the, with both people in the relationship, but actually working on the environment. So for example, it might be about reducing any distractions in the environment. It can be as simple as that. It can be about how you sit down and have some protected time to actually have a more effective interaction. It might be about upskilling the, the partners, the communication partners, be that the spouses, the daughters, the carers, to actually communicate in a way that is gonna be more helpful for the other person. It might be about uh, providing strategies. So combining these last two areas. So thinking of ways that we can use alternative means to communicate perhaps using gesture or pictures or whatever meets the needs of the individual um, that I'm and the people around them that I'm working with. Now, I, I have to emphasize that there is no research evidence about speech and language interventions for people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And in actual fact, we are commencing a small research project that we would like to invite you to. And I'm going to ask my student, speech and language therapist, to introduce this project to you. Hi, I'm Connie, and I'm currently a master's student at University College London studying speech and language therapy. I'm conducting a study aiming to learn more about the problems with speech, language and communication that people with behavioural variant FTD experience. We are looking for fam family members or carers who currently or in the past have cared for someone with behavioural variant FTD. Importantly, while we do want to hear about your experience with speech and language therapy that people may have had, this isn't necessary to take part in the study. It will be equally helpful to hear from people whose family members have not accessed speech and language therapy. We are asking people to take part in online focus groups in December 2021. And because they are online, we require you to have either a tablet or a computer with internet connection. And those focus groups will be run by me and another speech and language therapist. Um, if you have any questions at all um, about this study, please do not hesitate to get in contact with me. Um, my email is constance.jackson.20 at ucl.ac.uk. This project is part of a larger study, the Rare Dementia Support Impact. If you decide to take part in the focus group, we'll also ask if you'd like to take part in other RDS impact study projects. And um, there is a link in the newsletter if you'd like to find out more, but you do not have to take part in any other projects. This project is um, supervised by Dr. Anna Volkmer and Dr. Chris Hardy. I really look forward to hearing from you and many thanks for your time. So thank you very much for listening, everybody, today um, to my talk. If you have any questions at all, I am always available. Um, I have popped my um, email address up down on the slide for your information. Thank you for your time. Bye now. Great. So thanks to um, Anna. Um, and um, if anyone is interested in taking part in that and you missed the details, just um, contact Nikki and her team. Um, afterwards um, and we can send you the details but a really important um, piece of work and something we don't really know um, a great deal about. So um, let's move on um, and we're going to hear next from uh, uh, Dr Tim Rittman who's a consultant uh, neurologist um, in Cambridge um, and I said I've known Tim for many years so very grateful for him to um, come and talk today and he's going to tell us a little bit about um, motor problems in behavioural variant FTD. Tim, thanks very much. Thanks, John. Um, it, yeah, it's a real pleasure to, to be invited. And um, as I say, uh, as John has pointed out, we go back a good number of years. So it's great to be um, still working together. Um, and 
and you know asking me to talk about this really important issue actually in, in um, FTD. So what I'll do, um, I've got um, a, a, only a, a couple of slides uh, really. So I'll show some slides um, and then we'll sort of uh, talk through some of the um, some of the movement issues. So yeah, my name is Tim Ripman. I'm a neurology consultant um, just up the road in Cambridge. Um, and I spend two days of my uh, week doing clinics for people, particularly with, with movement problems in, um, in um, FTD and similar disorders, which I'll talk about. Uh, and then um, three days doing research into these kinds of diseases. So um, when we think about you know, um, FTD and other types of, of dementia, people often focus on the, the sort of cognition and the thinking and uh, side of things. You know, when people first mention the word dementia, people often think about memory, for example. Now, you and I know that in, in FTD, um, other parts of the brain are affected, not just uh, memory. Um, and of course, the brain doesn't just control our, our memory and thinking and behavior. It also controls our, our movement. So if I want to move my, my right arm, um, the impulse for that will come from the top of the brain through the, cor the cortex, go through a bit in the middle of the brain called the basal ganglia to smooth out the movements, um, and then head off down the nerves and, and into the arm to, to move my arm. Um, and in um, FTD, um, different parts of that whole system from the top of the brain, this um, black box called the basal ganglia in the middle of the brain, and some of the nerves coming out uh, from the spinal cord can be affected um, to cause um, problems. Um, so, so as neurologists, we're quite bad at sort of splitting what we call cognitive disorders and, and what we call movement disorders, but actually there's a, a big overlap uh, between the two. So even people with what we you know, traditionally called a movement disorder, like Parkinson's disease, actually can have mem memory and thinking and cognitive problems as well. And in the same way, um, a disease like fr frontotemporal dementia that we traditionally think of as being a cognitive disorder actually can affect movement parts of the brain. So when people have done surveys of this, about eight out of 10, every 10 people with FTD will have some kind of problem with their movements because of, uh, because of FTD. So um, the first thing I wanted to do really was to, to go through some definitions because when we send out clinic letters and, and so on, um, you might see some of these uh, words. Um, you know, as doctors and particularly neurologists, we're great at making up um, complicated words for things which are relatively simple as a sort of shorthand. Um, and these have been handed down from generation to generation of neurologists. So I thought it might be interesting just to uh, just to go through and, and do a bit of explaining as to what these um, uh, what these mean. And I've grouped these in in sort of pairs because it's things that often go together. So um, we'll start at the top. So um, apraxia um, is a term which um, it, uh, which uh, describes difficulty with coordination. Um, so if I go to do a movement, um, sometimes the brain um, it can't initiate that movement and doesn't quite get it right um, and it makes it difficult to work out what you're doing with your hand and that's called apraxia. Um, another word we, which is as similar to that is dystonia so when um, the brain doesn't get things right in terms of where the hand or arm should go you might put your hand out and the, the fingers are pointing in odd directions for example um, and that's called uh, that's, uh, refer, refer, refer to that as dystonia. Um, there are two types of, of stiffness in uh, neurology um, and uh, one's called rigidity and one is called spasticity um, and they essentially from you know, from the point of view of the person who's experiencing these symptoms they're very similar um, but rigidity um, affects that sort of black box in the middle of the, uh, the brain which, which um, is affected in Parkinson's disease um, and spasticity um, is caused by problems further up at the top of the brain. So if you've had a stroke, for example. Um, it's important to, to uh, as neurologists to differentiate these two things because they have slightly different treatments. Um, and uh, so they, we approach them in slightly different ways. So we may spend a bit of time when you come to clinic, waggling your arm up and down and backwards and forwards, trying to work out whether you might have rigidity or spasticity. Um, there's a couple of, um, of, of, thing, of ways that uh, the arms might be twitchy or tremory, which are relevant to uh, frontotemporal dementia. We might come, come back to these uh, later on. One is called fasciculations, where the muscles twitch or tremor. Um, another is called myoclonus, where 
you might have this just in um, in a finger where this finger is jumpy or jerky. You might have it in an arm where the whole arm is jumpy or jerky and occasionally the whole body can jump and twitch and jerk. Um, and that jumpiness and jerkiness is called uh, myoclonus. Um, there's two terms at the bottom, um, which um, is sometimes confusing. Uh, one is, is bradykinesia, and this just means slowing down of movement. So a, a lot of people with, um, with FTD and with other neurodegenerative type you know, wear and tear diseases of the brain will slow down, um, and that's called uh, uh, bradykinesia. Um, what you may see in some letters is, is um, Parkinsonism, um, and it might be, this can be a bit confusing because you think, well, I've got, already got one diagnosis. I don't fancy another diagnosis of Parkinson's disease as well. But this Parkinsonism, and it's the ism bit on the end, which is important, um, means something that looks a bit like Parkinson's disease, but isn't Parkinson's disease itself. So that means a combination of some slowness, so bradykinesia, stiffness, rigidity, and tremor. So if I said to you, Parkinsonism means bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. Hopefully, you'd you'd um, have some idea what that uh, what that means now. So um, I'll just stop stop sharing there. We'll just go through some of the um, talk through some of the issues that people have with uh, with FTD and similar and um, uh, disorders. So first thing to say is that um, same as Anna pointed out with the speech and language problems not everybody will, will develop problems with uh, movements um, and certainly you don't expect to, to pick up all of those um, symptoms um, that we've we've just been through um, but um, there may be it, it's not uncommon um, and I think it's important to recognize uh, when movement problems crop up because they can they can be treated in specific ways um, and also uh, you know, we, we, uh, as a doctor, I tend to think about medications, but actually for a lot of these movement disorders, it's about the environment um, and getting things right for the person in terms of the home um, and managing their mobility from a very practical point of view. So when we talk about um, behavioural variant um, frontotemporal um, dementia, um, particularly, one of the commonest movement problems that people have um, is actually related to the cognition itself. And it's, they're called stereotypies or repeated movements that are more habits than anything else. So, for example, I've had you know, patients with FTD who spend their time you know, drumming on the table. Um, and, and that's uh, you know, a, a stereotype movement. It's a habit. It's something they do all the time. Now, if um, the person with uh, over an FTD was in, on their own in, uh, in a room with no one else around them, actually, that, that movement might not be too much of a problem. but um, in the same way as some of the other symptoms of, of, of behavioural variant FTD can be socially inappropriate or, or annoying or very frustrating to live with, these, uh, these repeated movements can, can be annoying in the same way. So uh, whilst there is, in terms of treating those stereotype movements, there isn't a specific tablet which would make those movements go away, um, but sometimes we think about taking the edge off some of the behavioural uh, elements of, of FTD with um, a mild sedative or uh, other, other treatments to indirectly treat that uh, movement and that annoying sort of habit. So that's the first way that um, FTD can affect the brain. So through the, uh, through, um, the cognition um, causing these stereotyped uh, movements. Um, this, this, the other things that I'm gonna talk about now are all sort of overlaps with other diseases. So um, one of the, one overlap uh, disease which, uh, frontotemporal dementia can come with is motor neuron disease. So you may have heard of that um, separately, or you may have come across it in the context of people who have both frontotemporal disease and motor neuron disease. It's not uncommon for people with um, frontotemporal dementia um, to have mild problems with their, with their muscles, which look a bit like motor neuron disease. And if you go to a motor neuron disease clinic and meet the people there, some of those people with motor neuron disease may have some mild features of frontotemporal dementia in terms of the disinhibition and the way they interact and so on. Um, occasionally people will have um, overt signs of both. So you'll have behavioral problems and you'll have more obvious signs of motor neuron disease. So what does motor neuron disease look like? Well, it's, it causes um, stiffness. So that's um, spasticity that we talked about earlier. Um, and it can cause um, weakness um, in an arm or, or a leg. Um, 
in addition to that, one of the things that we look for in terms of making a diagnosis is fasciculations and muscle twitches. So uh, this can be um, subtle at first and, and get worse over time. So we'll often look for, um, as a neurologist, you may see a staring at your, your arms or your back. Um, and we're looking at particular muscles in the, the triceps muscle here or the muscle here or the paraspinal muscles which run down the, the, the side of the back staring at them, looking for these fasciculations to see if there's any evidence of, of, of motor neuron disease in addition to um, frontotemporal dementia. So that's the two ways that, that probably mo the most common um, um, movement disorders in, in behavioral variant FTD, so the stereotype movements and uh, motor neuron disease. I'm gonna mention two other um, diseases or diagnoses which I see a lot of in the clinics that I do um, in, in Cambridge. One is called progressive supernuclear uh, palsy and the other is called corticobasal degeneration. Now you may say, well, this is a talk about FTD. Why am I mentioning these two other diseases? Well, it's although they are um, distinct diagnoses, it's quite common for people to have features of both. So there are people in my, um, in my clinic with a diagnosis of progressive supernuclear palsy who have cognitive and behavioral changes, which are very much the same as frontotemporal dementia. Sometimes people develop the behavioral features of frontotemporal dementia first, and then later on they develop some of the movement problems of progressive supernuclear palsy. So people can switch between these um, different diagnoses over time. So progressive supernuclear palsy is um, a problem of, of movement. So it causes um, rigidity, so that's a type of, of stiffness that looks a bit like Parkinson's disease. Not particularly in the arm so much, but in the neck. So um, it might be very difficult for them to move their head from side to side. Sometimes the neck is pushed um, forward, sometimes it's pushed back. Um, and they have problems with balance as well, so they very often fall over. Um, so one of the, um, the, the first symptoms that people often have with, with PSP is falling over. Um, there are some, um, some very specific um, problems with the, with the way the eyes move in progressive supernuclear palsy we, that we use for, to help us with the diagnosis as well. Um, so sometimes people complain that they can't read because they can't track across a page very well because their eye movements have slowed down. So it's not just the, um, uh, the limbs and the trunk which are involved, um, but also the um, eye movements. In terms of treating some of that um, stiffness and slowness in, in progressive nuclear palsy, we do try medications that are used for Parkinson's disease. Now, if you have straightforward Parkinson's disease, those tablets work incredibly well. If you have um, PSP or some of those uh, slowing down movements in, in the context of frontotemporal dementia, those tablets work less well. And probably about 20 or 30% of people get a bit of benefit from them, but it's worth trying. So that's progressive supernuclear palsy. The other um, uh, disease that I want to mention is corticobasal syndrome or corticobasal degeneration. You might hear the two, two terms together, but they're essentially the same thing. So um, again, that can come in the context of frontotemporal dementia. So some of my patients who have a movement problems of corticobasal um, uh, syndrome started off having either the language problems which, um, or the behavioral problems of frontotemporal dementia. So one of the commonest um, pairs, if you like, of, of diagnoses that we see in this, these FTD-like diseases is the non-fluent variant of primary progressive aphasia. So this is people who have problems with their speech, um, which as Anna was talking about earlier, and particularly um, grammar and getting the words out. Um, so there's non-fluent aphasia with uh, corticobasal syndrome. Um, one of the, the first words I mentioned on that list was apraxia, which is difficulty with coordination, and that's very prominent in corticobasal syndrome. And um, we sometimes talk about apraxia of speech in the context of non-fluent af aphasia, and it's the same thing in, in terms of difficulty coordinating speech is this, uh, um, and difficulty coordinating the limbs. Um, it's the same underlying problem, but causing problems with movement in two different ways, in the movement of the, the um, tongue and the mouth and the muscles required for speech and the movement in, in the hands. Corticobasal degeneration can have other symptoms as well. So um, I mentioned dystonia, so often will people will put their hand out and it will be in a funny position, or sometimes it can be clenched up in a fist or, or um, tight into the body. 
And it can also cause what we call an alien limb um, sy syndrome, where the hand might drift up into the air and suddenly you find this hand that's touching your face. And you know, where, where's that come from? And you realize it's your own, your own arm. So they, you can have difficulty controlling the hand and realizing it's your own movements. At the most extreme level, this you can have an alien hand which sort of goes and picks things up and grabs things um, from, we have um, patients who take food off other people's plates, for example, because uh, it's almost like an automatic habit. That's what, uh, you know, food there, I grab it, I eat it. Um, but that's not under voluntary control. That's a part of this alien limb syndrome, the hand reaching out and doing things on its own. Um, so I'm just going to um, just go back to the um, presentation just to sort of summarize those things um, briefly. So we've talked about um, frontotemporal dementia causing these sort of automatisms or um, stereotypical um, uh, stereotypies, stereotype movements. We've talked about the overlap between frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease. Um, and then we talked about these two diseases which can you can have elements of in frontotemporal dementia or they can come together with the frontotemporal dementia. Progressive supranuclear palsy causing falls and slowing down um, and corticobasal syndrome causing this apraxia, so difficulty with coordination, the dystonia, funny posture and um, rigidity um, with stiffness. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there and um, I look forward to the questions in the, in the panel in a little while. Great, thank you so much, um, Tim. Um, very clear and hopefully I can see already there are lots of questions about um, most symptoms already coming up that will be coming your way Excellent. Um, in the, in the Q&A. So I'm gonna talk very um, briefly um, about uh, if I can uh, find my uh, slides, which now have just disappeared, but I will open them in a second, just about um, other symptoms um, in, um, that we see in, in behavioral variant FTD. So, great. so hopefully everyone can now see my um, slides. So let's just take a step back. Um, obviously the core um, features of behavioral variant FTD are changes in behavior and personality. And we'll just remind people what those core things are that help neurologists and, and um, psychiatrists make a, a diagnosis. But there are other changes in behavior and personality. You've heard from Anna about language, you've heard from Tim about motor, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of other physical symptoms, including what we would call autonomic um, symptoms as well. So a reminder that, that these are the core symptoms that people use to make a diagnosis. So five real groups of changes um, in behavior of which you need three to make a diagnosis or two plus a change in thinking. So apathy or loss of motivation, disinhibited behavior, which can include things like loss of manners, more inappropriate behavior, becoming quite impulsive, um, uh, rash act actions and um, poor trusting behavior. And then there's change in appetite, commonly a sweet tooth, but can be overeating, um, drinking too much alcohol, smoking too much, can be a number of different things. Obsessive compulsive behavior, which sometimes can be quite complex. Um, compulsive behavior like cleaning or checking or hoarding, but sometimes can be quite simple, repetitive things like Tim mentioned around um, stereotypies. And then there's also loss of empathy, loss of, of interest really often in, in family members particularly. But there are a number of things that are not in those diagnostic criteria. And these are things that I'm sure many of you will recognize, but some are, are quite rare. Some of them are not really mentioned when you look things up on websites about um, FTD. So obviously one of the core things is no real insight. But there's also that difficulty understanding emotions in others. Some of that part of that is that loss of empathy, but in general, just not quite getting what other people are trying to say. Those very subtle, non-verbal ways that we um, express emotion to others. Also, this change for some people in liking for sounds or music. So sometimes liking it more, sometimes liking it less, a lot less, being quite sensitive to sounds or music. Change in sense of humour often um, change sometimes to more simple or childish humour um, compared to more 
sophisticated humour before. Sometimes a change in religiosity or spirituality often becoming more religious or more spiritual than they were before. Um, something that we've talked about before in our groups, a change in sexuality, so sometimes um, more, so hypersexual, or sometimes less, sometimes no interest, loss of libido. Often a change in sleep, and sometimes that's um, uh, less sleep, but more often um, specific to FTD, that's um, often too much sleep. Um, and that can be quite disordered, so change in the sleep-wake cycle, it's so often sleeping during the day and not great sleeping um, overnight, which can, of course, be quite frustrating. And then in a smaller number of people, um, we can see people who get hallucinations, commonly visual hallucinations, so seeing things that aren't there. But sometimes it can be um, auditory, so hearing hallucinations. Sometimes it can be what we call tactile hallucinations. So um, a sense that, that there's something on the skin or crawling or... Um, a sense that there's something um, around the body. And then lastly, delusion. So delusion is, is a uh, thought that is false and it's very fixed. So that can be quite paranoid, paranoid that people um, are after people, but sometimes it can be the thought that there is someone else um, in the house or that they're friendly with someone that is famous or, or that, there's, um, that they know people that they don't actually know. So um, that's not very common, but definitely happens in, in, a, in a substantial minority um, of people. So those things we don't often always talk about, but those things are important and all, all changes that people in this group have described in the past. Um, and then thinking about other physical symptoms. So sometimes people have just multiple physical complaints that never have a a cause is never found. They've often been to multiple doctors for things, and that can be a mix of, of complaining that there are changes in their body which feel like physical symptoms not related to the brain, but there's often multiple physical complaints without finding anything. One thing that we've seen more over the years is this altered sensitivity to pain, sometimes with a higher pain threshold, sometimes with a lower pain threshold um, than before. And then there's this group of symptoms that we would call autonomic sy symptoms. So the autonomic nervous system is the nerves in our body that control our bodily function, how we pass urine, how we um, open our bowels, um, our blood pressure, um, our um, temperature regulation. And those are uh, can go wrong more commonly in other disorders, so other uh, neurological problems. Um, and particularly in forms of dementia, more common in conditions like dementia of Lewy bodies, Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease. But they can happen um, in people with frontotemporal dementia as well, particularly as time goes on. So there might be a change in going to the toilet. Um, there might be some dizziness. Um, there can be a change in how people tolerate temperature. So um, often wearing T-shirts out, um, in the freezing cold in the winter or big coat on all the time in summer. That can, for some people, rarely include sweating as well. And that, those are really probably changes in our, in our autonomic um, nervous system um, as well. So that's um, really a, a kind of rough going over some other things that people um, have, will have thought about. I think it's important to recognise that those are part of the illness. So they're not often not something separate. They can be part of having behavioural variant FTD and they're part of um, uh, uh, the condition as time goes on. So important um, things to recognise. And we can talk a bit about those um, later on in the Q&A for people interested. So before our Q&A, we're going to hear um, from Leo Duff. Very kindly, um, it is a carer for someone, um, her husband, who has um, behavioural variant FTD. Um, and we're going to hear her in conversation with Nikki about her own experience of things. Thank you. Good morning. It's fantastic to be with you this morning. For those who haven't met me before, I'm Nikki Zimmerman, and I'm joined today for the members experience with Leo here. Good morning, Leo. Good morning, Nikki. Now, Leo, you look after your husband, Nick, who's living with FTD. 
Can you tell us a little bit about Nick's background, about his career prior to his diagnosis? Yes, Nick was a GP and he was a senior partner in a busy practice which he built up from two people when he uh, joined it up to, I don't know how many doctors there are since he retired, but there were like seven or eight before he retired. And it become, like all practices these days, an enormous amount of staff backing up everything that took place. So he's a very, very busy person. And he's a dad and everything, a granddad as well by that stage. He was pretty fit, intelligent, very musical, very quiet and modest. So when I first began to notice things were a bit dodgy, it was firstly around money. We used to sort of share responsibility about money. And I realised one day a lot of money had sort of, well, we didn't seem to have the right amount of money. And I discovered anyway some credit cards that he had only used a couple of times but had then forgotten about and had done silly things with and there's lots of interest and everything. And at the end of the day, there was about 35,000 pounds when I eventually got to the bottom of it all. And I mean, that's over quite a few years. And he was becoming quite distant and vague. And if I said to one of the kids, oh, I can't get your dad to make a decision about blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, mom, he's always very quiet, you know, you don't, don't worry about it. You know, he's fine. I got his brother and sister-in-law to come and stay one weekend. And also his sort of best friend from medical school days came and stayed one time and they all said, no, no, Nick's fine, you're worrying, there's nothing to worry about, he's fine. Um, I just thought he was a bit depressed. He started dressing down at work, which was not like him at all, because he was like old school suit and tie kind of GP. And then one day I came home and he was home and it was a Monday lunchtime. Like Nick went out at half seven, quarter to eight and came back about eight o'clock at night. I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> but um, the partners at the Monday lunchtime partners meeting had asked him to take some time off because they thought he might be depressed and that he should have some investigations into this. And they very kindly paid from the practice for Nick to go to the priory and see a psychiatrist. And we went and saw this guy and he said, oh, no, 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 I'm sending you to a neurologist. So we were trotted off to a neurologist the next week. And he said what he thought, which is actually pretty well exactly right. So six months later, we had a diagnosis. So Nick stopped waiting, never went back for surgery from that day on. He must have felt absolutely terrible, but he just sort of quietly got on with things. I invented lots of jobs for him to do to keep him busy and things that were visible that you could see that had been done. So that was the start of the big journey. And, you know, it is that losing the independence and adapting is really very difficult for people. And one of the things that we see an awful lot is, you know, losing independence of driving and having to stop driving. Was that an issue for Nick? Yeah, that's one of my favourite subjects, Nicky. Um, we had a terrible car crash and Nick didn't drive from that day on. And we had our grandchildren in the back of the car. Thankfully, they were asleep when, and they just sort of like woke up with the crash. And I just said, oh, God, the car's broken down. But we Nick clipped the edge of a road sign, which was quite close to the edge. But he obviously sort of veered over a bit. And um, instead of putting his foot on the brake, he just put his foot in the accelerator and drove straight through and over the middle of a roundabout with shrubs and things in it, out the other side, took down a concrete lamp post on my side and a metal concreted into the ground crash barrier. I just thought, don't panic about this, just get him to slow down. Because I realised what had happened, that he put his foot in the accelerator and said, but anyway, slow down, we pulled in, we got out, police came, you know, AA and all the rest of it. They eventually got back to Kingston um, with the kids and everything out of the car that we could salvage, because I knew we'd never see that car again. And um, walking back from my daughter's to our house I said well Nick what do you think happened and he said I don't know and I said well you know do you think you should still be driving and he said doesn't know no so he never drove again there had been a couple of things leading up to that that I was a bit concerned about and getting very worried about actually and I phoned the DDLA um you know because the one year license thing was coming up 
and they went and looked it up and came, the guy came back and said, oh, um, your husband has renewed his license for next year. And I said, oh, right, okay. When did he do that? It had been like a few days before. So obviously the thing had arrived in the post. Nick had taken it and acted pretty quickly to get his license. I can't remember how long that was before we had the crash, but it was within the year, you know. And if he hadn't stopped then, I had made my mind up that he was going to stop. But you know, spatial awareness was something that I was worried about with the driving. And one of the first things that started happening was Nick was saying things like, you know, if we were going somewhere, and we'd say we've got two tiny little wheelie bags to stick in the boot. He said, oh, those won't fit in the boot. I'll have to go and put the seat down. Uh, you know, which, I mean, frankly, you could get about 50 chairs in the back of our old car. But um, if we were doing something like reverse it into a very small parking space, you could do that perfectly. This was an old car. We didn't have those cameras and things that tell you how to park, you know? So we had this very strange spatial awareness, which didn't add up. When we spoke before, I know you've told me that Nick's really, you know, he was really very active, very fit. He loved his walking and very, and loved his cycling as well. Um, but, you yeah. know, with the development of the disease, he did sort of get much more sort of motor symptoms coming in. And you, you made some quite creative adaptations to enable him to still have some physical activity every day. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, firstly, um, I insisted that he go and walk our daughter's dog every day, which was actually a huge help to her, genuine, as you know, everyone needs some help. You know. So off he went to walk Emerald's dog every day, which meant he had to walk to her house, get the dog, take the dog for a walk, take the dog back home, then walk back here. So that was a good two hours walking. Now, previously, Nick was a very, he really enjoyed cycling, and he wasn't part of the sort of cool light brigade and didn't even have a fancy bike. He was just like rock solid cyclists. We just start, we go at the same pace, uphill, downhill, really, really steady cyclists. And he did a lot of charity bike rides as the doctor. So he'd take holiday and go off and do this. And if you're the doctor on a bike ride, um, you actually do the book ride twice because <laughs> you've got to cycle up and down the trail of people cycling. You know, whether it's 100 people or 15 people, it doesn't matter. You've got to cycle up and down and keep an eye on people and make sure they're okay and encourage them. And um, he used to do that a lot. I mean, he did really big ones. He did a, he did a trek, actually, in China on the Great Wall and Sinai Desert, Vietnam, lots of things in France and Belgium and Germany and all over the place. And really enjoyed it. And he was very, very fit. And then I began to worry about him going out on his bike. And he was going out on his bike a bit less. And I thought, oh, gosh, has something happened? And what's going on? I decided one day that there was something wrong with the rear wheel of his bike. And I just took it off and threw it away. That meant he couldn't go out on the bike. But it was fine. He didn't. He had actually reached the point where he started to think that, well, he was, just wasn't doing it so much. He was obviously losing his confidence anyway. That, meant I was then not worrying because I every time I went out I was just getting more, more and more worried was something going to happen and where was he and would he go on the right side of the road or pull out of the car or something just thought well right okay that is an accident it's not going to happen now uh, and he still is walking actually quite a lot uh, he's very very slow and he doesn't look around so much but he does look around. he seems to be going like this a little bit but he's got this four-wheeled walker um, it's got a seat on it, which was about 124 pounds, I think. And it's the best money I've spent. We got to the point where going out for walk really quite dangerous. I mean, he's with somebody when he's having a walk, right? But even so, he'd like fall off the curb and just suddenly go to step out in the road without looking. You know, again, like the bike thing, quite dodgy. Because I never remember if it's busy or OT, somebody came out with it. I said, I think a walker would help. And they brought one to try. And we went out onto the pavement in front of the house and just shot up up the road with this. And it really made a difference. Um, and that's so important, isn't it, for his well-being? Yeah. Really, yeah. really. He's quite staggery around the house. We don't have a walking aid in the house. But, you know, the house isn't that big. So he, he can sort of, you know, use his hands on bits of furniture or a banister or a bit of wall or worktop or a table or something. 
so we can get along slowly in the house. Um, and I've got carers and myself, of course. So um, talking with the carers that you have, which I know has been a real godsend to you, they're very helpful when it comes to meal times because Nick has FTD and that great symptom of gluttony and eating everything in sight, which yeah, right. has been an issue yeah. for you. Yeah, Nick would eat anything and everything. I mean, the other day we had a bit of marble out of his mouth. The day before it was a little bit of wood that was sitting around. I thought it fallen off something. I thought, oh, I better not throw that away. And um, I just sort of set it on the kitchen worktop beside my notebook. And I turned out and he got it in his mouth. You know, it was quite a splintery little bit. But we got it out. And he was not going to open his mouth. My God, it was awful. You know, he really had to physically force his mouth open. He wouldn't. He wouldn't play ball at all. We can't have any food sitting around. We've got a fridge, you know, a built-in fridge. And I mean, our, it's oh, it's been there a very long time. And I'm very glad because he's forgotten that that cupboard is a fridge. So he doesn't go into the fridge to get stuff anymore. I'd actually bought another fridge and put it somewhere else. Um, one thing that really upset me about the food thing, I mean, lots of things have upset me about the food thing, but one thing that really upset me was in the fridge one day, I find one of these black clear plastic boxes with an uncooked burger and an uncooked bun in it. And he'd obviously eaten the other one that would have been in the other section of this box, raw. He'd obviously gone and bought this at the corner shop and brought it, this is when he was still going out in his room well, and eating it. And because there were two, and it's funny that he didn't eat them both, but anyway, probably it was so revolting and difficult to chew and swallow that he couldn't manage both. I but I find that and I realised what had happened and I just thought, oh my God, this is awful. Plus, hugely dangerous. So that led me to stopping money. At that point, I'd already got, you know, a few quid going into his bank account each month just so he had, when he went out with me or with somebody else who could pay for something, you know, dignity thing. So I stopped the money then, so he couldn't go around buying stuff. But you know what, Nikki? We went around getting stuff for free. Like we go into a cafe, or we're in an art gallery one day, and I'm an artist, right? So we're in an art gallery one day, like quite often in an art gallery. And you know, he's like greased lightning, you know, not beside me. God, he's in the cafe eating this huge piece of cake and a coffee at a table. And I went over to the lady. I said, "Oh, I'm, um, I need to pay for my husband's." coming in and oh, no, it's all right, it's fine. He's lovely, it's fine. Oh, don't worry, you don't need to pay for it. And this happened, I mean, honestly, you have no idea, you could go to all sorts of places and just get something and look innocent. And like, obviously somebody who wasn't quite right. And he just pick up all this food for free all right, Kingston. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And you do have to see the funny side of that. So anyway, with these wonderful carers that we've got in our place, what we do is here's an empty plate, and the person that's there has the plate of food, and he's given one mouthful at a time, very slow pace, and ensuring that he drinks in between mouthfuls to make sure that he hasn't just swallowed it to here, but that he's swallowed it right down. So that's how we manage that, and obviously at the diet, um, we don't have you know, like beans or pork or anything that's difficult to cut up with due to swallow. There's lots of rice, lots of pasta kind of dishes. I mean, for breakfast, he's porridge, prune, banana, cream, sugar, because he's had huge weight loss despite the eating and gluttony that was going on. But we've got a very strict routine regime of food now. And um, he's lost a lot of weight. So we're under advice not just to give him, you know, busy food and cakes and biscuits and chips and things that normally look good. Ooh. You have chips once a month, you know, <laughs> with all this healthy food stuff that's going on. Um, so he can have whatever, whatever you know, we think he might like. You, you can't cook with him around. You've got to have two people in order to prepare a meal one to keep him away, and one to quickly get the food ready. You, know, you can't always just like do everything in one go. Sometimes they get something ready and then go off and do something else. You know, because you can't, I mean, I can't put the stuff out in the worktop to get a salad ready. If he's there, I'm just going to put like one bit at a time and then put it away. <laughs> Gosh, you, you must be highly organised. 
Leo, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of insight um, on what your life's like um, now. Um, you've gone through huge changes sort of over the years. Leo is going to be with us on the Q&A panel today. So please, if there's any questions at all that you'd like to put to her um, about what she spoke about or any other questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you, Nikki. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Leo. Perhaps I can ask everybody to turn their um, microphones and their cameras on um, on the panel um, and we'll get started um, with some questions um, about things. And just say Anna, unfortunately, couldn't um, make it um, today, um, but is very happy to um, answer people's questions. So if people do have anything, they can always direct it via Nikki and her team. Um, and, and Anna, very happy to get back to you um, after the message. And just, um, Nikki's put this in the chat, um, but um, just a reminder that the, you know, the session, the whole session is recorded and the link to the recording will be um, sent out next week. So if there's anything you've missed, you feel like there is, um, uh, there are some things that um, you would like to uh, um, go back to and hear again, then um, the recording will be, will be sent out um, next week. So I'm sorry, when I said switch cameras on, I meant to the panel um, only, no one else can switch their cameras on. So I'm sorry if that wasn't uh, clear. So um, we might start um, a little bit with um, Tim. So um, first question um, comes from uh, one of our members. It says, my wife has been living with BVFTD and PSP for many years. Um, are there any medications that might help with the severe rigidity of the arms with the hand of one arm up by the chin, both hands are clenched, difficult to open and keep clean. Cinemet doesn't seem to help. Yeah, it's a, it's a very challenging situation and unfortunately it's not that un uncommon with PSP. And we talked about the sort of dystonia, the sort of hand being in a difficult position and that can cause this problem um, of the hands. And it, yeah, it can make um, to the hygiene very difficult because particularly when the hands are clenched shut, you can't get into the palm and that can cause sores and so on. Um, and unfortunately, the experience of cinemet not making a big difference is also co common as well. So what we try in that situation is um, there's another Parkinson's medication called amantadine, which we often use. Um, that can sometimes help but when the uh, rigidity and, and dystonia is that severe. Um, what we'll often do is uh, resort to Botox. So that's an injection into the muscles, which um, which relaxes the muscles. It doesn't bring any function or use back to the hand, um, but where there's either pain or difficult difficulty with hygiene because the muscles are so clenched, um, we'd offer, often recommend that. Um, so yeah, I, I would suggest having a chat to a neurologist or um, local physio team and re, re, rehab teams can be very helpful with this as well. So often what, what we'd recommend is Botox, but follow up with a physiotherapy to try and help keep that hand open. And Tim, do you offer that in, do you do Botox within your your um cbs psp clinic or do you refer them on how do you do that in cambridge no we we refer people on um because if you if you need it, it it lasts about three months and then it wears off um so rather than coming all the way to cambridge because we see people from across the east of england um there are people around the around cambridgeshire and further afield who we know um, do botox so people tend to go to their local hospital for for botox um, it can be a bit hit and miss as to where that's available um, but uh, there should be a clinic nearby most people. Yeah, and, and, and the physiotherapists are very used to this kind of symptom, and, and often it's the physio that's asked the neurologist to see them again, having, having seen um, this very, you know, this dystonic, stiff, um, stiff arm. I'm going to stick with you for a bit, Tim. So um, another question that says, are there any drugs for corticobasal syndrome, even though BVFTD is the main diagnosis? Yeah, so uh, I talked about using the Parkinson's type medications for um, progressive supernuclear but we also try the same thing for corticobasal syndrome. So the Madapar or Cinemet, which is sort of mentioned before, um, which is a sort of common drugs for Parkinson's disease. And sometimes we try mantadine as well. Um, again, they're not um, terribly helpful in, in a lot of people. So some people say they, they make a bit of difference. Um, I think there was a question particularly around the alien limb features of sort of reaching out and grabbing things or holding on to things. 
um, that's a symptom that's very difficult to treat actually. Um, so it's, it's, that's where you know, it's more about the environment and getting things right you know, around, the, um, around the person to try and make that easier. Um, some, some people find that holding on to, to something in, in the hand can make that easier. So it's not sort of going off and, and doing other things. Um, but it's being aware of, of what situations the hand will sort of shoot off and in. Um, there's a part of the brain that has all these sort of programs, if you like, for different movements ready to go. Um, and in CBD, that's sort of on a hairline. So as soon as the, the brain sees something, it'll just do it. Uh, it's very difficult to stop the brain, uh, stop the brain doing that. Um, and again, the, the dystonium and stiffness we've just been talking about is very common in, in CBD. So we probably recommend more Botox in, in corticobasal syndrome than we do in some of the other diseases we've talked about. Tim, can I ask you a little bit about what you recommend to people in your clinic about um, exercise um, mm. and, and physio in general? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, exercise is good for, for all of us. Um, and the people I see with movement problems often have an issue with balance. And I think that's where keeping walking particularly and uh, mobile can be helpful to try and maintain that balance and that independence for as long as possible. Now that comes with the, um, the sort of flip side that you're more likely to fall over and injure yourself. So getting that right sort of balance of keeping active and independent um, versus it falling over, that risk of falling over and injuring yourself is, is tricky. Um, but you know, I think on the whole, there are benefits to exercise um, in terms of balance, in terms of getting out and about, just for sort of general mental health and seeing, seeing the world around you. Um, um, and in, in terms of keeping keeping the arms and legs moving, which you know might prevent some of these the, the worst of this um, stiffness, but I think there comes a time when the, the disease does catch up and that exercise just gets um, too much. Um, so it's uh, it's a very individual um, it's very individual to, to decision as to how much exercise you do. And physiotherapy can be helpful. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily reverse or you know, it, make the, the movements better, but it can help cope with some of the movements, cope with some of the stiffness and rigidity that we've been talking about. And also very importantly, help help you get off the floor as well. Because if you're on the floor, it's actually quite hard to get up. So the physios can often help with strategies to, to walk up a, a chair, for example, um, or have a partner help you to, to, to stand up. Great, that's super helpful, Tim. I'll give you a little bit of a break for, for a minute or two. I'm going to go on to a, maybe open to, to everybody, which is um, uh, from one of our members whose wife has had um, familial FTD and PSP for 12 years, and really two major problems. One um, feels like quite an autonomic symptom, flushing in the face um, and some sweating, um, which is difficult um, and not um, no real great medications for that. Um, uh, you know, we recommend things like how the kind of bed clothes and the kind of things you wear at night and using cotton and things that are a bit more comfortable. Um, but the other problem is about sleeping during the day. And that's something I, I kind of touched on, which is often this reverse of the sleep wake cycle and very difficult for carers when people are not sleeping um, at night, but then very sleepy during the day or sometimes just sleeping all, all of the time. I'm actually going to ask perhaps Leo whether that's something you have experienced or whether have, have any experience of how to deal with sleep and what strategies you have. And I I'll start by just a nice message from one of the um, people saying, thank you, Leo, for your open and honest picture of life with your husband. You, have, you are amazing with all the strategies you have in place, which is a nice thing. Thanks very much. Well, actually, interesting. There's so many things that everybody has said so far, and I'm going like tick. Tick, tick, and the this, this sweating thing has just started recently being noticeable. And you know, we've we've gone through all different sorts of bedding. This is mostly at night, by the way. We've gone through every kind of bedding you could imagine, as Nick became incontinent and so on. And we started sweating at night. And really strange. I haven't had an opportunity to ask anybody about this yet. More on one side than the other. And yet he lies very calmly and quietly on his back, slightly turned like this every night and hardly moves at all. And he started sweating for no apparent reason that we know. 
at night. So it is something that I'm just moving into, John. Mm. You know, I don't know where it's going to lead, and I haven't had an opportunity to bring it up with the next expert so far. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think he's totally looking... unaware of temperature for himself yeah. or food or touch or anything. So, you know, he isn't bothered by this. He's totally unaware of it. And where it comes from, I don't know. So my experience is just starting on that particular subject. Very difficult. And I think, you know, it sounds like already people are putting messages in. I think it is a mm -hmm. common, but the reason I put those things up is just, to, you know, for people to know that those are the kind of things that's occur. But I, I think, you know, we don't have any great solutions to that beyond, um, beyond the, as you said, the kind of bedding and the kind of night clothes that you use. And um, interestingly, you know, we do recognize in neurology that some people do develop this half body um, uh, sweating on one side more than the other, not something I've seen in FTD. Tim, what's your experience of, of sweating and how do you manage it? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's very difficult. It's, it's something people report. Um, and um, yeah, I, I always struggle to, to, to make any sort of good recommendations other than you know, what we discussed in terms of bed clothes and you know, you know, light cotton pyjamas and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very difficult. Um, and in terms of the sort of sleep wake cycle, I was going to ask you, John, actually, because we've had a bit of success using um, a melatonin, which is a sort of hormone yeah. that the body makes and can sometimes reset the sleep wake cycle. Yeah. It works for some people, not for everybody. But actually, we've had challenges getting it prescribed as well because it's not, uh, it's quite a limited um, uh, to the number of things that GPs are allowed to prescribe it for. Um, so when it was, it yeah, no, I definitely, I use melatonin in in clinic melatonin natural sleep hormone it's what keeps our sleep wake cycle you know in the us you can buy it over the counter to help with your jet lag um not available over the counter in the uk it has to be prescribed it's pretty side effect free because it's not it's normal hormone it get, can get you for some people it can just get you back in into the normal sleep wake cycle and it there's not no great evidence in in ftd at all but but Anecdotally, I've had an, a number of people who it's helped with, and often better than often people come to me and they've been given a, a, a sedating drug and then they feel really sedated and feel very bad in the morning and sedated through the rest of the day. And so often we, we, we try melatonin rather than something that's, um, something that's very sedating. But I'm glad to hear that you've got some, had some good experience as well of that. Yeah, yeah, particularly when there's the problems of getting to sleep. I think when people yeah. wake up later in the night, it's not quite so helpful. That's yeah. right. So yeah. getting to sleep is particularly helpful. Okay, um, I'm going to ask, um, uh, uh, as I go through, I'm going to um, uh, uh, go on to another symptom that was part of me, a couple of these autonomic symptoms. So I'm talking about incontinence, urinary incontinence, or whether that's a symptom. Now, that is complex in FTD. Um, some of the incontinence is because our frontal lobes are the overall, they're the kind of top bit of the control of us passing urine. And so sometimes just either part of this disinhibition or part of um, the, um, the way that the brain controls um, passing urine, that in itself can be a cause of incontinence, but also as can problems lower down. So particularly involvement of the autonomic system. So yes, definitely problems passing urine can be a problem and perhaps Nikki um that's something you get asked all the time and think about how we deal with that there are incontinence um local district nurses incontinence nurses what, what would your advice be Nikki? Really it's a question that we do get asked really very regularly about it and we always sort of ask people to check in with their GP to make sure that there's not any underlying health issues going on or something else that's causing this and you know the continent services or sometimes called the bowel and bladder services are really available for people to get advice from. A lot of people don't know that the GP can refer them to these um, services and get free pads from them as well. So we really sort of um, make this some, a service that people are aware of, but also thinking about sort of at home, um, if people are have this compulsiveness of wanting to use the toilet all the time or struggling to use it to make sure that the bathroom is really visible make sure there's a sign on it or make sure that the door's open so people can see where it is and also look at the, the clothing as well and if you're down to use the toilet and you've got a great big buckle belt on in your or 
or you know so, lots of different layers it's making it easy and accessible for people really sort of to, to help them as much as possible uh, and although it can be sort of quite annoying for carers at times having to constantly go to the bathroom because there is that obsession of this and sort of using lots of toilet paper we see this as well it's just sort of managing those situations as, as best as you can and just just helping them and assisting them on their way I think one of the things that we really try to get over to people is you can't do this alone and if you are the sole carer in the house and you're not sharing this responsibility for this these issues that will come up are going to be so much more difficult on their own and I think as Leo could probably find if I finds now having extra hands in the house to share this burden and help is really really helpful. Going back to sleep for a minute and someone has said is spending longer time than usual in bed a problem my wife doesn't stare from bed until woke and I haven't thought this is a problem but is it I think that's right you know we talk um to um <clears throat> a lot in this meeting about um problems with changes in behavior and how you deal with them and whether you need to deal with them are they who are they problematic to um are they problematic to the person um are they safe or unsafe and those are the really the key thoughts they might be annoying that someone doesn't get out of bed or it might not be it might actually give you a bit of time to get on with things that you don't have time to get on with otherwise and, and that can be difficult so i think that's right um i you know um it, it one has to choose one's battles in terms of what you think um, you're going to be able to deal with in terms of dealing with symptoms and someone getting out of bed a bit later if that allows you to do something else I agree with the, the person who's commented on that it, it, it isn't doesn't need to be felt of as a problem I think Nikki any thoughts yes it's all about weighing at risk isn't it it's getting that nice balance of comfort and well-being for that person and putting yourself in their shoes what's good for you might not feel good for them and it's what they are comfortable and is good for their well-being and asking yourself what is the risk there and if there isn't any risk it's sort of changing your mindset and your coping strategy uh, to keep that person happy and comfortable Great. So I'm going to quickly go through this. Someone has said, could development of Raynaud's um, be part of autonomic dysfunction? FTD? I've never heard anyone with that symptom before. I don't know if I've seen it. Tim, have you ever seen anyone with Raynaud's? No, I saw that question. I have to be honest. I, that's not something I've seen either. So I No. Know. So, um, um, uh, Leo? Yes, um, Nick has Raynaud's quite badly in his hands. Always had it or just about two No, years? no, um, probably about the last six to nine months. Hey, right. Hands are always icy cold. Yeah. Um, Purple and white. I think Almost it's something like we it. need. We perhaps need to ask people about. So it's probably sounds like something we should be. Uh, um, someone I, else has said my husband is, also has Raynaud's. I feel like this is something that's unreported. Mm -hmm. In in, I've never had anyone tell me that. But that but there are three people already. Um, so maybe that's something Nikki we need to need to have a think about. So Tim, we're going to come back to you with one question, and there's a whole set of questions about medications, which I want to which I want to cover. Um, so um, the question is about fasciculations and whether they can come and go. And someone said, I've seen my husband have fasciculations in the tongue. The tongue now looks shrunken. Um, so perhaps chat about fasciculations, what they are, and for people who don't yeah. know, I know you talked about it. Yeah, so the, these fasciculations are sort of ripply, um, twitchy movements in, in the muscles. Um, so, I mean, it's, they can be normal, so we can all have them from time to time when you, particularly after you've done some exercise or something, you might get that sort of little twitch in your muscle and, it, and that's it and it's gone. Um, but um, when we talk about fasciculation in the context of frontotemporal dementia, we're sort of, it's often uh, sort of um, subtext or it, we're, we're talking about motor neurone disease type um, symptoms and that wasting of the tongue sound you know would also be sort of in that spectrum of, of movement symptoms um, and often the two go together the fasciculations of the tongue so the tongue is some, sometimes called it looking like a bag of worms because it's sort of rip, rippling and, and moving around um, and yeah they certainly can come and go depending on what you're doing um, and sometimes depending on the stage of the disease as well um, so they can be there early and disappear late, later on 
Um, so I'm not surprised to hear that, they, uh, that the circulations are coming and going. Um, sometimes it can be hard in clinic because you're told about them and then you look for them and they're not there. So you have to sort of yeah, come back later on. Great. So I'm going to try and cover um, medication in one. So there are a few questions about it. So I'll say what we do in our clinic and, um, and I can talk through, ask Tim their experience as well. So there are not, the problem is that we're coming from not a good evidence base. So there are a number of small trials that have shown that the group of drugs that are used in depression called SSRIs, and um, they're things like sertraline and citalopram and other drugs, that there is a small evidence base that they can help with behavior. Not just they're not treating depression, they often can, some trials showing they can help change with behavior. And so often we will trial people on SSRIs, but not everyone gets a good benefit from those. Um, and um, we don't have a great deal of experience, but we have a number of people who've been put on um, drugs that are otherwise used in bipolar disorder, things like um, sodium valproate. Um, there's no evidence at all, really, about using sodium valproate. And anecdotally, some people have said they've had some benefit from it, but there's no evidence really about using it. The next level up, in a way, is thinking about the, the drugs used in schizophrenia, antipsychotic drugs, things like quetiapin and risperidone. We try our best to avoid those. And we think about, and we've talked many times in this meeting about ways of managing, particularly later stage, without those drugs. But sometimes there is a risk and benefit, and sometimes they can be, and they can be useful in terms of agitation, aggression, other things. But we do our best to try and manage those symptoms without drugs. It's a bit of a risk um risk benefit because those drugs can undoubtedly have side effects um as we talked about we do our best to try and avoid sedatives if we can but again some of these things are risk benefits sometimes if it can help you get off to sleep as long as it's not um causing you to be very sedated in the morning that can be fine um, and really it has to be on a kind of symptom by symptom basis again people have talked about using benzodiazepines like lorazepam or promethazine promethazine which is a antihistamine these are sedating drugs we try to avoid those if we can but if someone's really not getting off to sleep and that is the only thing that can be helped as long as it's not causing any major side effects or making people worse then sometimes there is just a bit of a risk benefit there tim your experience in drugs and i should say that cambridge are really at the forefront of testing drugs for symptoms and you had your your team um um, and through um, the head of the centre, James Rowe, really mm. um, trialling lots of drugs to really help with different symptoms in, in FTD and perhaps just a brief of what you do now and what you might do in the future. Yeah, I think you know, our experience is very much the same as yours. It's, it is often trial and error. And you're right. You know, our first thought is, can we get away without using medications and change something about the environment in some way to make things e easier? Um, so you mentioned the number of drugs. We, we, um, we probably use a fair amount of a drug called trazodone, which is a sort of mild sedative, um, which we find can take the edge off some of the behavioral symptoms as well. Um, but yeah, we have a trial at the moment um, called Norax, which is, has just started. And we should try to look at um, using a drug called atomoxetine to try, try and change some of the behavioral symptoms in, um, in, in uh, well, actually, progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, so it's but some of the behavioral symptoms that are associated with that. So, yeah, um, and yeah, certainly James Rose leads that work, um, look, trying to use um, some sort of um, advanced brain scans, looking at um, brain waves, something called magnetoencephalography or MEG, to try and, and pick out signatures of behavior in the brain and, and use that as a starting point to say, well, if we give someone a drug, can we change those brain signals? And then as the NeuroApps trial, then go on to try them for, for a longer period of time to see if they're helpful in the longer term. Great. So there have been some questions about speech exercises for speech and language therapy. And um, Anna will answer those. So anyone who's answered any questions about language, um, Anna will um, reply back to you. Um, I'm going to just cover in the last minute anything um, I've, I've uh, missed. So someone said, is there any correlation between the ACE, that's a cognitive test, and the stage life expectancy of FTD? No one's really looked at that. But of course, the expectation is that if you're an um, ACE score, your cognitive score is going downwards, then of course, that's likely to correlate well with the progression of, uh, of the disease. Um, uh, and uh, um, 
uh, one question is about repetitively saying names of things, house names as they walk past. I mean, repetitively saying words they see, that's very common. Um, again, part, but really part of that behavioral variativity, part of that kind of a, um, simple, obsessive, repetitive, um, repetitive behaviors. So that is um, very um, common. Um, someone recommending um, a love to move exercise program run by the British Gymnastics Foundation, not something I know, but something perhaps for us all, um, uh, for us to uh, look into. Lots of people saying their hands are cold. I think something we need to, something we need to look into. Um, great. So I think that's, an, and perhaps one last one about being unable to walk and losing muscle power. I think, well, you know, that, that can happen as Tim talked about you know, sometimes that important for the neurologist to have a look at. I did see one message, which was in the Q&A, which was just about how do I build a network? And I think the answer to that is speak to Nikki uh, and her team. I think, you know, if you feel that the support you're getting from your local physician um, is not enough um, and um, uh, uh, it, it's, um, you know, um, Nikki can recommend. We have lots of specialists around and accessing to people either through our team in Red Dementia Sport or through one of the specialist FTD centres in Cambridge or London or Manchester, Bristol, lots of other places where there are people where you can try and build that network of people. And if you feel lost, it's fine to go back to the GP um, and, and ask for a new referral and, and you can try and... Um, uh, 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 really, Nikki can give some advice on your local place. Is that fair, Nikki? Yes, absolutely. We've got lots of regional groups. And, you know, the, the beauty of Zoom, which has come in since the pandemic, is people don't have to be geographically close to you. We can connect people very easily that way. So, yeah, please do get in contact. Great. So um, before you go, um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Nikki and her team, as always, for organising um, this event and Alicia and Shima for um, helping organise things. Thank you very much to Tim for coming along. We'll hear from Tim hopefully again in the future. Um, uh, thanks to Anna um, as well. Anna will um, uh, uh, get back to anyone with questions about language. Thank you so much, Leo. I mean, you know, as always, it's just so wonderful to hear that the experiences and the lived experience of it. And, and so thank you for sharing that. I know it can be difficult sometimes, but thank you um, very much. Thank you to Livy um, as well for fielding all the questions and getting them all over to me. Um, so please just stay on. We're funded RDS by the National Brain Appeal um, and just stay on for a couple of minutes just to hear um, from the National Brain Appeal and our goals to try and get our own RDS centre and to really expand the work that Nikki and her team are doing. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming along. Please be in touch with us if you have other questions and we haven't managed to answer them today. Have a nice day, everybody. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. Thank you.
We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW Polo. And we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for rare dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the Senior Fundraising Officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.